Good morning, everybody. Um, it's an honor for me to be moderating such a prestigious panel. We're going to be talking about engagement, engagement <coughs> principles and strategies in 2013 and beyond 2014, if, if you ask me. Um, so due to time constraints, I'm going, not going to spend too much time introducing the members of the panel. Their full biographies are on the packs that you have. Uh, and I'm going to allow them to present their work um, for three minutes or so each. And then we're going to be looking into <coughs> two main areas for engagement, two main issues that we've identified. The first one is focusing on the two practitioners on the table, Mr. Bernard Dicard and Mr. Laura Berry from Casey Deports and ICCR respectively. We're going to be focusing on the how. How do we do engagement? What are the techniques that practitioners use in practice? What are the challenges that they face? What works, what doesn't, in, based in, in their experiences? And then we're going to be focusing on the challenges that engagement pose for researchers and academics. And for that, we're going to be talking to Tessa um, and uh, Peter Clarkson on, sorry, sorry Tessa Hebb and Peter Clarkson on the challenges they face at the time of research. What's, what are the challenges they face in accessing data, uh, quantifying this data, and, and basically providing statistical and empirical evidence for investors to then carry out their, their work. So without wasting any more time, I'm going to let them present on their work, and then we're going to be uh, opening the floor as well to questions from the audience and comments from the audience. Thank you. So. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thank you, Maria. I'm Bernard Ricard from Caisse de Depot, and I'm in charge of the European Listed Equity Portfolio. Uh, our engagement policy stems directly from our, our identity. We don't think there is one single engagement uh, type of strategy that can be efficient, but we designed ours based on, the, on our own identity of a long-term shareholder, very long-term, 20, 30 years in French companies, for instance, and the average line of portfolio is about seven to eight years. Second, the fact that we're a public institution, so that has constraints, and obviously, in terms of uh, engagement, it would uh, push us towards bilateral engagement. The long-term the long-term uh, standing in the share capital of the company has value to the to the to the companies, and we want to leverage that. So, the last thing is that we are an asset owner, which means we ourselves are those who engage. Therefore, in terms of organisation, what we have established is to push the profile of fund managers, it's a small team of six people, from pure investor to shareholder. That means the portfolio manager is the one who anal analyzes, scores, values, buys, sells, votes, and engages with the company. So he's the single person the company has to talk to on all shareholding matters. And uh, therefore, he's the one who talks to the company CEO and starts to engage. Now, this is where I, it comes to our invest, uh, engagement policy and strategy. We leverage our position and in having contacts quite easily at CEO level, definitely in France, we have contact at CEO level with all companies, and therefore this is where we start our engagement policy. At, in, me, in meeting on a one-to-one -one basis, a CEO, that is where we raise the, uh, the engagement themes we have chosen. Only at this level, and then we go to the dedicated ESG specialists within the companies to continue to discuss. CEO level is decision-making level. So this is where we want to, to start. In this respect, uh, we, the, because we're a small team, we have n chosen not to dedicate anybody to ESG subjects because we want the fund managers to incorporate ESG issues in the global analysis of the companies. <coughs> Therefore, 
we have uh, we identify topics to address the companies on in ESG matters. We have established an internal rule that at every one-to-one -one meeting with the CEO in a company, at every meeting, the portfolio manager has to raise a question about ESG. This is documented and I can track that. It's also in the personal objectives for bonuses of the portfolio <laughs> managers and it counts. A little pressure sometimes helps. So it means that every time we meet a company at CEO level, Caisse de Depot will be viewed as somebody who flags an issue on these uh, matters. I said we are a small team, so therefore the fund managers have to select two, three topics maximum to work over time with the companies. I want them to be free to select whatever topic they want because I think it will be more efficient because they will be convinced of their own work and that would uh, be easier. And over time it has proved fairly, fairly efficient, I must say. Now, afterwards, we have met the CEO, then we meet the ESG specialists. Of course, we have to make follow-up. So at the next CEO meeting, or CEO level meeting, we try to follow up on the topics we have, uh, we have raised. So far, uh, this has uh, given us a few successes. However, we always select company-specifics topics. We do not go on very broad topics. We think there are people who are very well equipped and quite efficient to do, to do that. Therefore, we see our efficiency in addressing company-specific topics. And that is where we see a few advances and improvements. Thank you. Laura, would you like to go next? Or? Oh, sure. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Thank you to PRI and CDC for uh, inviting ICCR to participate today. You know, I think it's, it's particularly important to uh, be a practitioner in this kind of a setting because I don't know how often you as academics have an opportunity to hear how very much we appreciate your work, how absolutely essential it is because the Interface Center on Corporate Responsibility has been involved in corporate engagement as investors for 43 years. We began really with movement roots, roots that were driven by the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa. And since then, our portfolio of issues has grown enormously. We represent somewhere around $120 billion in uh, U.S. dollars in capital, uh, about 300 members. Our members are primarily institutional investors who represent religious orders, foundations, unions, investment managers, and a wide range of folks who really have understood for over four decades the importance of incorporating morality, values into making investment decisions. And so being here today with people who are working very, very hard to help us create the business case for why this is important is essential. Because I will tell you, as movement people who are involved in the capital markets, we have never had any trouble making the moral case for what we do. We have never had any trouble understanding why human rights is important, why protection of creation as religious investors is important. But sometimes what we sense, what we observe, what we believe anecdotally, and even what faith traditions have taught for 5,000 years, what we see and what as human beings we know is true, without the numbers, without the kind of work that Peter has done without the kind of work that Tessa does, without the kind of work that the students presented yesterday, um, we're not taken very seriously. We're patted on the head and said, oh, what lovely nice ideas. Would you please be in our commercial so that we too can be a moral and environmentally sensitive company, but we really don't think it matters. 
And so what is profoundly moving to me is to hear Bernard talk about what happens at Caisse des Depots. Because when you eliminate the idea that ESG work is a boutique, and when you say this is an essential part of predicting future value for companies, it's very, very important. So I've told you why we think your work is important and how you help us. Um, I did want to offer, however, how you might be able, how we might be able to help you. Because we have been doing this for 43 years, we have an extraordinary cache of archives that, and, and anyone who wants the uh, link and access information, please let me know. The Columbia University, we're based in New York City, and the Columbia University Rare Book and Manuscripts Libraries has all of our written documentation pre-internet, if you can imagine, all filed and taxonomically available. So if any of this is helpful to your research, please let us know. Uh, we do have a database as well, and we do have publications, some of which I have brought with me today, if you'd, if you'd like to see them. I'm hoping in our conversation today, some of the trends that we've observed in the last four decades begin to emerge. One of the trends is, as movement people, we began as adversaries. And over 43 years, because companies are very smart and they have seen some of the, some of the things that we're talking about and the way we look at future valuation is maybe a little different than traditional valuation models. Companies, I think, look to us now as information sources. And I would even argue that we are in the business of justice arbitrage. We look at companies differently. We therefore have different access to information. And we see things quicker than others do. In 1993, we filed six shareholder proposals with major financial service companies asking them to please take a look at their underwriting policies. 1993. Um, we all know how that turned out. So. Why this works, I think one of the best papers that I have seen describing how ICCR works today is a paper by Fabrizio Ferraro and Daniel Beunza. Um, are, Fabrizio, are you in the room, by the way? No, I don't think so. Um, I did see him yesterday at the conference. Yes, sir. Oh, oh where, where are you? Oh, there you are. There you are. So I'm giving a plug for your paper. And if I get it wrong, you can just correct in the question and answer session. Um, but basically, they describe a process rather than conflict. They describe a process that talks about how religious investors sensitize various companies to issues, reframe those issues in ways that the companies can make their business cases internally, particularly the internal advocates. That because we are committed investors, and Bernard mentioned being a long-term investor of 20 or 30 years, religious investors actually have an investment horizon of eternity. And so we, we consider ourselves to be actually the longest, um, the longest term investors. And finally, when necessary, breaching the dialogue so that we really can cause a little discomfort within the company. Um, we think that's very effective. And so I'm hoping all of these things come out in the conversation. I appreciate your attention, and I really look forward to questions and discussion a little bit later. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Tessa, would you like to go next? Thanks. Thank you, Maria. And again, um, thank you to, uh, to PRI and CDC for the opportunity to meet here in Paris and uh, uh, have, a, have a good exchange on, on these really critical issues. Um, in my own academic work, I've really looked at these issues around um, around uh, responsible investment really since the mid 1990s, and it's it's getting hard to believe that that's uh, almost 20 years of uh, of uh, investigation in this area. Uh, it um, it certainly, as a researcher, uh, it it's extremely fulfilling uh, working in this area. I would say that uh, each day I, I kind of meet the day with a, a high level of excitement, especially if it's going to be a day of research and writing as opposed to a day of departmental meetings. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, so 
you know, for me, the the corporate engagement issues really started to surface about uh, uh, 10, uh, 10 or 15 years ago. Um, what I started to see in the pattern uh, was this uh, the the institutional shareholders indicating that engagement, corporate engagement, was their preferred strategy. And as many of you know, who have either looked at these issues or are yourselves asset managers and asset owners, you'll know that in many cases it's actually in the responsible investing policies and programs uh, of the asset owners and asset managers that engagement is their preferred strategy. And I found this to be very interesting because I, I you know, coming out of my own research, I, I said, now, um, that is an interesting way to frame the strategy when we have uh, no evidence as to whether engagement is effective. Uh, no academic evidence, that is. And so that really propelled me in terms of my own um, academic agenda to try to investigate whether uh, th the effectiveness of engagement. Because what you really want to see, if it's your preferred strategy in terms of responsible investment, is whether it changes uh, company behavior and increases and improves their standards. So that, um, that's a, a, a really big uh, research agenda, as you can imagine, that can propel a, a, an entire academic career. And, uh, and so, you know, we, we, in terms of coming uh, to a theoretical framework uh, on which uh, to look at these issues of engagement, um, you know, I've really drawn on two, uh, two large areas. Uh, one being the principal agent uh, question in terms of the relationship and role between the, the owners of the, of the company and the managers of the company and the struggle that occurs between them. And, um, and then uh, uh, additional work in terms of shareholder and stakeholder saliency. What makes the stakeholder uh, and, and in this case, the shareholder, what makes the company listen? What makes them attend to these questions? Uh, and um, and what, what, what do they do in response uh, to these requests from the, from the uh, uh, shareholder? All of this framed in, um, uh, as I referred to with some students last night, in, in, in uh, some of the ideas of universal owner hypothesis that uh, Jim Hawley has been really instrumental in taking forward. So I, I, I stress to my students that it's very important to have a solid theoretical frame on which to stand. If you don't bring that to the, to the research, you're always standing on a rickety, uh, a rickety structure. And um, since one often has to defend one's work in peer review, it's a good thing to have a firm structure underneath you. Uh, and I do uh, actually also tell my students, if you can find a Nobel Prize winner in that theoretical structure, so much the better. Failing that, a reference to Michael Porter does seem to do the trick. So, uh, uh, but this, uh, this uh, draws, uh, draws out that uh, putting a frame underneath. And then, the, 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 and we'll talk more about this, but um, the challenges. You know, yesterday, uh, uh, Elena Charrier talked about the fact that we need uh, f to have multiple disciplines engaging in the research that we do. And those disciplines come from both um, a, a quantitative uh, side of uh, their work in terms of their method and a qualitative side. And that actually means that the quantitative and qualitative researchers have to speak to each other and have to acknowledge the truth that's embedded in each of those methods uh, and, um, and strengthen that, uh, that truth actually in finding ways uh, that work together. Now my final note, Maria, is when we're talking about um, stakeholder saliency, many of you will know that this is based on a set of ideas that the shareholder brings um, 
a, a degree of urgency, a degree of legitimacy, and a degree of power in terms of their relationship um, to the company and having the company attend to their demands. And I, I would just give you a brief preview of um, uh, our panel at 5, 5 p.m. where I'll discuss a paper that I've been working on with Andreas Hopner. Uh, and my work up till now has always been qualitative in nature, really drawing on interviews. And all of those interviews, whether at the company level or at the uh, investor level, uh, stress legitimacy as the most critical component. Um, and, uh, and I've always um, drawn out this uh, need for legitimacy from the, from the um, investor in the engagement. And interestingly, in this new piece of research that is a quantitative rather than qualitative uh, piece of research and uses I, um, ICCR data, uh, we actually see the role of power uh, through the minority shareholder resolution as being vitally important. And power is usually, in the interviews, the least held up uh, attribute. And I've started to think, aha, so when we get to the numbers, we see that maybe in conversation and discussion, we don't want to talk about power. Uh, but in actual fact, power is a, 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 an essential ingredient. And I raise these two streams of research to show that uh, the qualitative and the quantitative need to speak to each other, because both have perspectives that allow you to see the, 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 the effectiveness of engagement in a much deeper uh, and more meaningful understanding. Thank you. Thank you, Tessa. Peter? Well, I, I think that um, you've probably already heard my thoughts on, on disclosure and the need to agitate in, in terms of, of the broader disclosure. The other side of this is really one that, that I hear my colleagues up here talking about engagement with, with companies is engagement with regulators. And indeed, if moral suasion doesn't work, then indeed do we need to go through the regulatory route to, to uh, achieve our, our objectives. Uh, provide context to that, within the Australian setting, the say on pay, remuneration has been a, a hot topic for, for nigh on 15 years now as it evolved from the 1990s where there was essentially no disclosure regulation or requirements and none of the academics were able to document an association between pay and performance. Through the early 2000s with a, a series of corporate collapses and remuneration being viewed as, as a part of that and mandated disclosure requirements up through the, the global financial crisis in, in 2007-8, followed by what, as a Canadian, I'd call a royal commission. They, they call it uh, slightly different, but uh, nevertheless, a commission set up by government to establish or to uh, inform the sort of rules that should surround remuneration in, in the Australian context one of the things that came out was say on pay. Now there was a considerable lobbying effort that, that occurred in conjunction with, with that Royal Commission and <coughs> their recommendations were brought forward. There was a subsequent lobbying uh, activity or, or engagement following the proposal or the proposed new rules. And what that's allowed for is a multi-period type of, uh, of study it is, it is a unique setting where we can see a, a staged series, of the, the sort of agency theory that, that Tessa talks about, some of the work uh, 20, 30 years ago by Joel Dembski suggested that this is a repeated game and, and that you don't see what lobbyists really intend in, in the first round, that it's only when you see a second round or, or a multiple, multi-period game that you, you start to get a real handle on what they're doing. What's come out of that in the Australian context is, is not just the advisory say on pay, but it is a two-strike rule. Quite simply, that if a, if a firm uh, gets a negative vote on their remuneration package in two successive years, there's a spill of the board, the board is dissolved, and there is a re-election for a new board. So there are now teeth involved with this particular regulation. 
I think from an academic point of view, that's a very interesting series of stages, and it comes at engagement from uh, rather than directly engaging, but rather engaging through the regulatory process. I find that very intriguing, and, and I see it as, as sort of a, an end game if indeed we don't succeed through the, the more normal or, or less in-your-face type of engagement. Thank you very much. So by now you should have a, a better idea of what each of the panel members uh, focus their, their work or research on. My first question would be for, for the practitioners on the table, and it's what do you expect from uh, researchers in academia? Um, I know that for investors, having hard empirical data is key to make solid investment decisions, and within within that area of work, uh, data is is data is power, data is money. So, what are you looking for from um, academics, from research houses, from universities in terms of providing that missing link, if you like? Thank you. Thanks. On our side, we we like to benchmark our. Uh, our actions and therefore access to information on what other investors do is very important. Although we ourselves are fairly discreet on what we do, uh, we, we need to know what uh, others do. So on controversial issues, I think there is lots of information available and research can work on that fairly easily, I believe. But lots of engagement actions actually happen on non-controversial issues. Mm -hmm. And this is very important, and this is our day-to-day -day life and day-to-day -day relationship with the company. That can be the harder uh, part to, to address and to research. I think, nevertheless, that companies, not only investors, but companies should be involved in the research. And I must say, if I may add a dissenting voice in these meetings, that I'm struck by the fact that in the three days of conference, not a single company is invited among the speakers. I think it's unfair. These are not such bad guys after all. We work for them over a long time, and they have views to, to, to bring. I'm not speaking on controversial issues, which may be more difficult, but on a number of topics, companies may share their experience about the engagement of some of their shareholders. And not any engagement is confrontational. So we ourselves uh, go into uh, work on, uh, how to say, um, amicable engagement that is research for improvement. And companies listen to good ideas. Sometimes they have not had the time to think, or they have heard it from other investors. It's good that they hear, hear it from us as well. So I would strongly, strongly encourage the companies, uh, you researchers, whose work is so valuable to us, to incorporate contacts with companies in this, uh, in this respect. Thank you. Laura? Oh, I warn you, I could talk about this for a half hour. I promise I won't. Um, let me organize my three reactions. First, I'll, I'll start backwards and say to Bernard and, and Caisse de, de Depot, um, come to the ICCR conferences. <laughs> there are always companies at the table. Um, and it can be uncomfortable sometimes. I think that that is why the research that I spoke about um, from Ferraro and Beunza is in some ways important because I think it ha and is an example of the kind of work we would like to see more of done. It has given us language and a framework to describe to other investors as we build coalitions around issues of importance. How it is that getting an internal advocate at the company to help deliver your message, to help reframe the message, to help advance the message when you are not at the table is absolutely essential to changing the kinds of behaviors that we would like to see, to really see companies develop their operations and to live into, if you will, the challenges that investors in our field put before them. 
There are three kinds of research that I think at ICCR we would find extremely useful, and I've already seen some examples of it um, yesterday and, and this morning. First is this idea of cumulative impact. Because we have more than four decades of experience here, we know that there is a certain momentum and a certain critical mass that builds over years and years of engagement. And I think that the, um, the, the, the young man from uh, Toulouse um, presented some information about what, what is the cumulative impact of shareholder votes and shareholder actions around issues and, and organized by types of investor. I think that kind of work is very important because it establishes momentum in a field and I think encourages others to kind of hang in there when it's difficult. Um, I think another piece of the work that we would love to see more of is a deconstruction of why this works. I think it goes to some of the comments that Tessa made a, a bit earlier, is that we all know that there is an interplay, a regulatory interplay, a policy environment interplay, and a critical mass accretion of benefit interplay. But being able to take those things apart and sort of do a factor analysis would be so valuable and I think also very interesting. So we would love to see a lot more work done on that. And then again, you know, we all know that establishing the business case and showing how this contributes to valuation models on the finance side of things is of course very important as well. So, you know, again, um, we'd love to see more work in this area. Great, thank you, Laura. Like with any issue, it has two sides. The coin always has two sides. The, the side of the, from academia and research is that accessing data on engagements is many times very difficult because many of these engagements happen behind closed doors for confidential issues. They're sensitive issues, so they're, they're, they happen on a one-on-one -on -one basis between the investor and the company. So for researchers accessing this kind of data, which happens on a personal level, it's difficult. But there are many other challenges to, to this and to providing the kind of information that investors are looking for. So from, a, from an academic perspective or a researcher perspective, uh, where do you see the, the constraints and what would you need from investors in order to carry out this, this research and provide the data that they're looking for? Thank you, Maria. It's, it is very challenging. The private nature of, of engagement uh, makes this a, a, a black box that's very difficult to, to see in. Uh, often for the investor um, and the company, the, the, the confidential nature of the exchange is actually a key component to its success. Uh, the, the, the company may well um, uh, take on board the, the, the requested change and make that change, but neither party in, in, the, um, in the exchange wants to make that public, even when successful, and even after a, 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 an extended period of time. And so we we do have a challenge on how to um, how to be able to look into these particular, uh, as I say, black boxes of uh, of engagement. Um, what we're finding is that in the cases where there's larger coalitions of investors who have come together to, to bring um, a more thematic engagement, or maybe across uh, multiple companies you know, moving on a, a particular set of issues, that information sometimes is easier to surface. Uh, and um, and when, when uh, in you know organizations like um, ICCR uh, are prepared to share their data, uh, which which uh, our our particular use of their of the data set uh, occurred after I was uh, making a presentation at the PRI in person uh, meeting that was held in Paris two years ago, and Laura and I pleaded, please. Please bring data, uh, because again, the exchange between the academics and the uh, PRI signatories that occurs at the PRI in person uh, meeting is a good way to facilitate an open access to more information and data. And Laura did indeed come forward to, uh, to me at the end of the, the panel and say, let's try to do something. So these, these uh, opportunities that the investor, 
the investors, in my experience, are often able to approach the company after the fact and say, we would like to uh, allow the researchers to come and look at this. Mm -hmm. This was a situation that we had um, a case on, say, on pay in Canada with the organization SHARE that's represented here, and my researcher, Heather Hajigian, who's represented here. Uh, and uh, SHARE, actually, the, they're the investor, went back to the companies and said, please open up documents, letters, files, meetings, interviews. Now, this does lead to the challenge of case study, uh, utilizing case study um, method, because for, uh, as Laura said, case study method has its pros and cons. Sometimes it's the only way to look into a particular issue, um, but it's limited by its, the singularity of the case. And, um, and so case study method is, I often describe it as more of an art than a science. The science is in the uh, empirical evidence of the case, and the art is in the pattern that's extrapolated from that uh, and what it can tell us. And what, we, what one normally wants to do then is to be able to test that uh, against a larger data set, to test that art uh, of surfacing the pattern. But it, case study method itself is, um, is often discounted, uh, particularly amongst the, uh, in the business sector. They would much rather see a large end sample uh, and, um, than to draw on a case study. And so you have to think of case studies as really uh, models of best practice. Uh, that that can be brought forward ra a, a, and instructive in that way rather than uh, as, a, as a, a truth. And the final thing I would say, uh, and we've been struggling with this over the last few months, is indicators of success. Uh, again, we could have a larger end sample if we had a, 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 a more third-party objective way to measure success at the company level. Because what, what are we looking to achieve with, with engagement? We're looking to, to achieve change in company behavior. And so we do need to have these uh, broader indicators, uh, not necessarily that are going to um, demonstrate causation, because that will never happen between engagement and a company change. That, that will never be proved, but at least uh, an element of correlation. Thank you. Peter? I, I don't have a great deal to add beyond what, what Tess has had to say. Certainly, uh, the research that I presented this morning can be characterized as circumstantial because it's correlational and we don't really understand the whys of what, what is happening. We, we document the relationships. To get at the, the whys indeed involves opening the black box, and, and I believe you've, you've described it as a black box. And it's only by talking to, to individuals that the, the sort of offer that Bernard has made to, to share some of, the, of the, uh, the case files, if you want to call them that, I think would be important. I, I, uh, I'm not quite as negative on case study as, as Tessa perhaps painted the, uh, the story because I think that's where we have to, to go to start to understand the dynamics, uh, be it in the environmental, be it in the remuneration, be it in, in any of the arenas, I, I think eventually we have to open the black box, and that is through case study. And I would just add, Maria, yes. that I was very interested when um, the Maastricht team with Rob Bauer wanted to, to look at uh, engagement. And you know they've really um, done a lot of, uh, of quant research in the past. But they, it, even for them, they were required to go to case study. And uh, I, I think I only, I'm not negative about case study because that's the method I use. Uh, I just feel the weight of the peer reviews when they come. <laughs> yeah. and, 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 and look, it's not the, the, the method I use, but I see the, 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 the true value, value of, mm. of case or multiple case studies. Yeah, brings it down to earth. <laughs> so, unfortunately, we have no more time, and uh, if, we, if we extend, then the whole day just drags on. Uh, I would just like to summarize um, what have, has been discussed by this panel, and I encourage you to 
get hold of, of each of them in the coffee break and please continue this discussion because this, this 45 minutes are just to open up the, the conversation, if you like. So ideally what we would like to see is, is to have more, more research that incorporates contacts with companies. I think, I think that as identified by Bernard, that's something that's missing, that, that link, that conversation with the companies to, to get to hear from them uh, what's the, what are the effects, the positive and the, and the challenges that they face when they're being engaged by investors. Um, this issue of, of having a mix or an interdisciplinary approach to research the topic of engagement, I think it's key. Not being afraid to go into issues like power and, and, um, and using methodology and theory uh, from other disciplines that are not clearly linked with investment, with um, business, basically. Um, this issue that Peter pointed, that it's key to have multi-period, a multi-period approach to uh, researching and, and investigating um, the effects of engagement. There's only so much you can say if you base your, your, your data and your research on three years or four years, but if you can show a trend over 10, 20 years, then it's when, when that data becomes valuable and becomes usable by investors. Um, this issue of quantitative versus qualitative, case studies versus uh, quantitative information, as, as rightly pointed out by all members of the panel, this needs to be uh, joined together. And um, the hope is that students that are being formed right now in different uh, universities and research centers can bring this to the jobs they might take within the investment sector. This not being afraid of using different methods, of using um, uh, theory that comes from dif different disciplines, from sociology to anthropology to economics, uh, in order to make an informed decision and incorporate environmental, social and governance issues in the analysis of their investments in the future. Um, there's also this need for deconstructing why engagement works and providing uh, a theoretical framework to, to do engagements, which is missing right now and which is being built by some research houses, but we encourage others to, to do the same. Um, and finally, what, what Tessa was saying is this need to have indicators of success in order for investors and companies to measure when they've achieved a milestone, when they've achieved success in, in their practices and in the engagements that investors do with them. So thank you all very much. I'm very sorry that this is very short, <laughs> but um, in the interest of the day flowing correctly, we, we're going to stop now. But I encourage you to continue the conversation with each panel member separately. Thank you very much.